Section 12 of Whirly Gigs by O. Henry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Whirly Gig of Life. Justice of the Peace, Benaha Widdup, sat in the door of his office, smoking his elder stem pipe. Halfway to the zenith, the Cumberland Range rose blue-gray in the afternoon haze. A speckled hen swaggered down the main street of the settlement, cackling foolishly. Up the road came a sound of creaking axles, and then a slow cloud of dust, and then a bull cart bearing Rancy Bilbro and his wife. The cart stopped at the justice's door, and the two climbed down. Rancy was a narrow six feet of sallow brown skin and yellow hair. The imperturbability of the mountains hung upon him like a suit of armor. The woman was calicoed, angled, snuff-brushed, and weary with unknown desires. Through it all gleamed the faint protest of cheated youth, unconscious of its loss. The justice of the peace slipped his feet into his shoes, for the sake of dignity, and moved to let them enter. We all, said the woman, in a voice like the wind blowing through pine boughs, once a divorce. She looked at Ramsey to see if he noted any flaw or ambiguity or evasion or partiality or self-partisanship in her statement of their business. A divorce, repeated Ramsey, with a solemn nod. We all can't get along together nohow. It's lonesome enough for to live in the mountains when a man and woman cares for one another. But when she's spitting like a wildcat or sullen like a hoot owl in the cabin, a man ain't got no call to live with her. When he's a no-count varmint, said the woman, without any especial warmth, a traipsing along of scallywags and moonshiners, and laying on his back with a corn whiskey, and a pestering folks with a pack of hungry trifling hounds to feed. When she keeps throwing skillet lids, came Ramsey's antipathy, and slinging boiling water on the best coon dog in the Cumberlands, and sets herself against cooking a man's victuals, and keeps him awake of nights, accusing him of a sight of doings. When he's always a-fighting the revenuers, and gets a hard name in the mountains for a mean man, who's going to be able for to sleep a nights? The justice of the peace stirred deliberately to his duties. He placed his one chair and wooden stool for his petitioners. He opened his book of statutes on the table and scanned the index. Presently, he wiped his spectacles and shifted his inkstand. The law and the statute, said he, are silent on the subject of divorce as far as the jurisdiction of this court is concerned. But according to equity and the Constitution and the Golden Rule, it's a bad bargain that can't run both ways. If a justice of the peace can marry a couple, it's plain that he is bound to be able to divorce them. This here office will issue a decree of divorce and abide by the decision of the Supreme Court to hold it good. Rancy Bilbo drew a small tobacco bag from his trouser pocket. Out of this he shook upon the table a five-dollar note. Sold a bearskin and two fox fur that, he remarked. It's all the money we got. The regular price for a divorce in this court, said the justice, are five dollars. He stuffed the bill into his pocket of his homespun vest with a deceptive air of indifference. With much bodily toil and mental travail, he wrote the decree upon half a sheet of foolscap, and then copied it upon the other. Rancy Bilbro and his wife listened to his reading of the document that was to give them freedom. Known by all men, these presents, that Ramsey Bilbro and his wife, Arilla Bilbro, this day, personally appeared before me, and promises that here and after they will neither love, honor, nor obey each other, neither for better nor worse, being of sound mind and body, and accept summons for divorce according to the peace and dignity of the state. Herein fail not, so help you God, Benaha Wudup, Justice of the Peace, in and for the county of Piedmont, state of Tennessee. The justice was about to hand one of the documents to Ramsey. The voice of Arela delayed the transfer. Both men looked at her. Their dull masculinity was confronted by something sudden and unexpected in the woman. Judge, 
Don't you give him that paper yet. Tain't all settled, no how. I've got to have my rights first. I've got to have my alimony. Tain't no kind of way to do for a man to divorce his wife without her having a cent for to do with. I'm a laying off to be going up to Brother Ed's up on Hogback Mountain. I'm bound fur to have a pair of shoes and some snuff and things besides. If France can afford a divorce, let him pay me alimony. Rancy Bilbro was stricken to dumb perplexity. There had been no previous hint of alimony. Women were always bringing up startling and unlooked-for issues. Justice Benaha Widdup felt that the point demanded judicial decision. The authorities were also silent on the subject of alimony. But the woman's feet were bare. The trail to Hogback Mountain was steep and flinty. Arilla Bilbro, he asked in official tones, how much do you allow would be good and sufficient alimony in the case before the court? I allowed, she answered, for the shoes and all, to say five dollars. That ain't much for alimony, but I reckon that'll get me up to Brother Ed's. The amount, said the justice, are not unreasonable. Ramsey Bilbro, you are ordered by the court to pay the plaintiff the sum of five dollars before the decree of divorce are issued. I ain't got no money, breathed Ramsey heavily. I done paid you all I had. Otherwise, said the justice, looking severely over his spectacles, you are in contempt of court. I reckon if you'll give me till tomorrow, pleaded the husband, I might be able to rake or scrape it up somewheres. I never looked to be paying off no alimony. The case are adjourned, said Benja Woodrup, till tomorrow, when you all will present yourselves and obey the order of the court, following of which the decree of divorce will be delivered. He sat down in the door and began to loosen a shoestring. We might as well go down to Uncle Zaya's, decided Rancy, and spend the night. He climbed into the cart on one side, and Arela climbed in on the other. Obeying the flap of his rope, the little red bull slowly came around on a tack, and the cart crawled away in the nimbus arising from its wheels. Justice of the Peace, Benaha Widdup, smoked his elder stem pipe. Late in the afternoon he got his weekly paper and read it until the twilight dimmed its lines. Then he lit the tallow candle on his table and read until the moon rose, marking the time for supper. He lived in a double log cabin on the slope near the girded poplar. Going home to supper, he crossed a little branch darkened by a laurel thicket. The dark figure of a man stepped from the laurels and pointed a rifle at his breast. His hat was pulled down low and something covered most of his face. I want your money, said the figure, without any talk. I'm getting nervous and my fingers are wobbling on this here trigger. I've got only five dollars, said the justice, producing it from his vest pocket. Roll it up, came the order, and stick it in the end of this here gun barrel. The bill was crisp and new. Even fingers that were clumsy and trembling found little difficulty in making a spill of it and inserting it, this with less ease, into the muzzle of the rifle. Now I reckon you can be going, said the robber. The justice lingered not on his way. The next day came the little bull drawing the cart to the office door. Justice Benaha Widdup had his shoes on, for he was expecting the visit. In his presence, Ramsey Bilbro handed to his wife a five-dollar bill. The official's eye sharply viewed it. It seemed to curl up as though it had been rolled and inserted in the end of a gun barrel. But the justice refrained from comment. It is true that other bills might be inclined to curl. He handed each one a decree of divorce. Each stood awkwardly silent, slowly folding the guarantee of freedom. The woman cast a shy glance of full constraint at Rancy. I reckon you'll be going back up to the cabin, she said, along with the bull cart. There's bread in the tin box sitting on the shelf. I put the bacon in the boiling pot to keep the hounds from getting it. Don't forget to wind the clock tonight. You're going to your brother, Ed? asked Ramsey with fine unconcern. I was allowing to get along up there before night. I ain't saying as they'll pester themselves any to make me welcome, but I ain't nowhere else to go. It's right smart ways, and I reckon I'd better be going. 
I'll be saying goodbye, Ranzi. That is, if you care for to say so. I don't know as how anybody's a hound dog, said Ranzi in a martyr's voice, for not wanting to say goodbye, unless you're so anxious to get away that you don't want me to say it. Ariella was silent. She folded the five-dollar bill and her decree carefully and placed them in the bosom of her dress. Benaha Widdup watched the money disappear with mournful eyes behind his spectacles. And then, with his next words, he achieved rank, as his thoughts ran, with the great crowd of the world's sympathizers or the little crowd of its great financiers. Be kind of lonesome in that old cabin tonight, Rance, he said. Rancy Bilbro stared out at the Cumberlands. Clear blue now, in the sunlight, he did not look at Arilla. I allow it might be lonesome, he said, but when folks get mad and wants a divorce, you can't make folks stay. There's others want a divorce, said Arilla, speaking to the wooden stool. Besides, nobody don't want nobody to stay. Nobody never said they didn't. Nobody never said they did. I reckon I'd better start on now to Brother Ed's. Nobody can't wind that old clock. Want me to go back along with you in the cart and wind it for you, Rance? The mountaineer's countenance was proof against emotion. But he reached out a big hand and enclosed Arela's thin brown one. Her soul peeped out once through her impassive face, hallowing it. Them hounds shan't pester you no more, said Rancy. I reckon I've been mean and low down. You wind that clock, Arela. My heart's in that cabin, Rance, she whispered, along with you. I ain't going to get mad no more. Let's be starting, Rance, so we can get home by sundown. Justice of the peace, Benaha Widdup, interposed as they started for the door, forgetting his presence. In the name of the state of Tennessee, he said, I forbid you all to be a defying of its laws and statutes. This court is more than willing and full of joy to see the clouds of discord and misunderstanding rolling away from two loving hearts. But it's the duty of the court to preserve the morals and integrity of the state. The court reminds you that you are no longer man and wife, but are divorced by regular decree, and as such are not entitled to the benefits and pertinences of the matrimonial estate. Arilla caught Ranzi's arm. Did those words mean that she must lose him now, when they had just learned the lesson of life? But the courts are prepared, went on the justice, for to remove the disabilities set up by the decree of divorce. The court are on hand to perform the solemn ceremony of marriage, thus fixing things up and enabling the parties in the case to resume the honorable and elevating state of matrimony which they desire. The fee for performing said ceremony will be, in this case, to wit, five dollars. Arela caught the gleam of promise in his words. Swiftly, her hand went to her bosom. Freely as an alighting dove, the bill fluttered to the justice's table. Her sallow cheek colored as she stood hand in hand with Ranzi and listened to the reuniting words. Ranzi helped her into the cart and climbed in beside her. The little red bull turned once more, and they set out, hand-clasped for the mountains. Justice of the Peace, Benaha Widdup, sat in his door and took off his shoes. Once again he fingered the bill, tucked down in his vest pocket. Once again he smoked his elder stem pipe. Once again the speckled hen swaggered down the main street of the settlement, cackling foolishly. End of The Whirly Gig of Life